you or someone you know is likely living on the edge right now. What do I mean by that? Many people are struggling to make ends meet. They work full-time jobs, making too much money to qualify for low-income assistance programs, but not enough money to pay all the bills. Tonight, you'll hear from those people and one lawmaker trying to help. Come on in. Hi, Kim Crosby and her eight-year-old pup, Izzy, live in this two-bedroom, 1150-square-foot home she rents for $2,250 per month in Fairfield. Used to a bigger space, moved from a three-bedroom, two-bath home in Vacaville because the owners wanted to sell the house, found this place here in Fairfield. That was two years ago, in the middle of the pandemic and a hot housing market. She downsized and is paying more. Her monthly rent jumped $450, just enough to put her in a bind. I am gainfully employed. I make a good wage, a decent wage but I'm unable to pay the PG&E bill. The state put a freeze on service disconnections for much of the pandemic, so Crosby, who works full-time, says she opted to pay rent instead of her gas and electric bill and now owes more than $4,000. It's like you have to be destitute in order to qualify for any of the financial programs or assistance that they have. And I don't qualify. I have a good job. I make a decent wage. You know, um, I have a good employer, but it's just not enough. It doesn't keep up with the rise in inflation. What am I gonna do? And she's not alone. State data show across California, more than 2.8 million energy utility customers were in some kind of past due debt between the start of the pandemic and the close of 2021. Go get it, go get your pup. Over in Vacaville, I met with Carrie Mathis and her puppy, Bailey. Good girl. She and her two kids were renting a home in Crockett and like in Kim Crosby's situation, the owner decided to sell during the pandemic. So Mathis moved to Vacaville to be closer to her aging parents. I couldn't find anything. At the time, the rental market was just like everybody was moving to Vacaville and Fairfield and this area. For that same reason, it was supposed to be cheaper. It took forever to find something, but I finally did. That was a year ago. She's paying $2,500 per month for a small four bedroom house for her and her 18 year old twins on a single income. I'm not a slacker. I work. <laughs> I clean people's houses for a living and that brings in a lot of money. I DoorDash, I Instacart, I work with a caterer and it just got harder and harder as the year progressed to be able to pay rent, PG&E, water. I was picking like, okay, which one am I gonna pay this month? I think I've just hit a wall. She says she's behind on PG&E and car payments, among other bills, and she's considering leaving California. It's just virtually impossible for a single income to make it anywhere here. That problem is not escaping the notice of state lawmakers. You have a large segment of the workforce that is sort of stuck, and even those who aren't as stuck are just barely making it and still working really hard uh, to meet the basic thresholds. That is not something that is sustainable. State Senator Steve Padilla introduced legislation this session that would require the state to create a formula to calculate a real living wage. This is the means through which we can measure and assess what is required to get housing in California and to live. Minimum wage, he says, doesn't take all that into account and never has. When California originally established a minimum wage, for example, at the turn of the 20th century, there was no baseline formula other than to create a proper living, which really wasn't fully defined. Over the years, California's minimum wage has gone up from 16 cents per hour in 1916 to 1550 this year. But there never was an underlying basis for how do you determine what that should be in the very first place. So the bill would have required uh, that formula to be created and decided upon, and it would have required that it be linked to housing costs regionally throughout the state and on an average throughout the entire state. The bill did not get out of committee this year. If I have to, I'll introduce 100 bills. I'll introduce it every year. He says it boils down to this simple principle. The deal is you work hard and you work honest and you'll be able to put food on the table. You'll be able to put a roof over your head. That is no longer true. And there is something fundamentally socially inequitable about that. And we're not going to be able to start to address it uh, in meaningful ways if we don't at least start collecting the data. He says that information could be used to make changes like expanding income eligibility for social safety net programs, the kind Crosby and Mathis don't currently qualify for because, again, they make too much money. One day at a time. 
That's all I can do. She and Crosby are sharing their stories to let others in their situation know they're not alone. It's not easy, but if I help one person, I'm glad I did it. I want to go back to Kim's PG&E bill. She owes more than $4,000, but she doesn't qualify for low-income assistance programs like the California Alternate Rates for Energy or CARE program. To qualify for that, the maximum annual income for a one- or two-person household is just under $40,000. Now, Kim and many struggling middle-class people make more than that. PG&E did offer her an extended repayment plan. Now, cost-saving options available to everyone, regardless of income, include a home energy checkup quiz where you can see where you can conserve energy in your home, rebates for smart energy-saving appliances and thermostats, budget billing, which is an option I use and like. It averages out your monthly payments so you can better budget for your energy bills. Uh, we have more information on these and more at abc10.com slash to the point. And finally, I want to thank Kim and Carrie for sharing their stories with us. It's not an easy thing to do. If you have any ideas or feel moved to help these ladies, please reach out to me and the To The Point team.